Okay, hello and welcome to season two, episode number three of Marketing Nuggets with Gabriela Ferenczi. That's my name. And I'm a German and Hungarian language teacher, language coach, and I live in London in the UK. And I run a boutique language training company here. It's called Prolingua Global. And I specialize in working with corporate leaders in the financial services industry. Now in January, 2021, I started a passion project, which I call Thrive Online. And it's a place where I share the nitty gritty of practical modern online marketing with fellow language professionals. And this show is also part of that. Now, in this marketing nugget, I'm talking to Bryn Bonino. So Bryn is a branding consultant. She runs a company called Backstory First, where she guides micro business leaders to use their own personal backstory as a, as a branding tool. She's also a former language specialist like ourselves, and she runs a website called Make a Leap, where she interviews language educators who made the leap from language teacher to language entrepreneur. And you will definitely want to check those interviews because it's, it's a treasure trove. And there are so many really interesting and inspiring stories there that, uh, that you really don't want to miss. Now, Bryn, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Gabriella. And thank you so much for the warm introduction. Listen, I think for you as someone who is a branding consultant and runs backstory first, like what is your backstory, please? Okay, so I will try to be concise with my backstory because as you can probably imagine, I really like digging into backstories and kind of getting all the details out to use that as a tool. But part of my backstory is that I will take you back a couple years when I learned that I was eligible for Italian citizenship. And I thought, well, I could apply through the consular system in the US or I could apply in Italy and possibly it, the, get the citizenship a little bit more quickly and then be immersed in a culture and a country that I wanted to be in anyways. So I, I found a couple jobs that I was el eligible for not having Italian citizenship yet. And they were all working in language schools in Rome. I interviewed with one language school. I had contacted them, them not advertising really for a position. And I said, this is who I am. I've been a language teacher for 10 years. I started my career in Rome. I'd like to get back. I've also worked for three years as a teacher trainer, specifically teaching educational technology strategies to language teachers. They offered me a position for 12 euros an hour. And when I asked why that rate, they said, because you've never taught here before. Then after having that experience, I found another position for being an educational technology trainer at another school. I found the person on LinkedIn who I would be replacing. He said to me, it's a nice place to be, but you won't be able to afford to live in Rome with what they pay you. And I thought, if I'm having these problems, I must not be the only one. But everywhere I look, the advice is just talk to people and see where is good to work. And I thought, well, I don't live in Rome now. That's the goal. How do I reach that goal if I'm living in the US? And so what I first did was I started a resource website and it was called Teach English in Rome. And I had created a resource library first with networking strategies that I have been using for years to successfully meet people and figure out that the jobs that I was applying for were nice places to be, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't pay me what I would need to live in Rome. And so I put that in an ebook. And then I also created a library of the English language schools in Rome proper on a website. And I embedded each, um, each page of a school with a review widget. So then people could share their stories of 
what was good and what wasn't so good in an, anon in an anonymous fashion. Try not to tell too much of the story to, to take too much time. But what I found the most valuable and what people were the most excited with um, was my interviews that I was doing of the teachers who were actually experiencing what I wanted to experience. And so asking them about what their stories are and fast forward is to where I am today. I've now interviewed I published 20 interviews with independent language teachers. Most of them still are based in Italy, but I am now pu uh, publishing interviews with teachers outside of Italy. So for example, I think you were actually one of the first interviews that I published that um, someone was in the UK running their business, not online, but in London and running their business. So thank you so much for, for kind of helping me make that leap as well. No, I thank you, really. And uh, so uh, my next question would have been actually what inspired you to start Make a Leap, but here you are, like you just, uh, you just summed it up beautifully. I'm curious though, how you, how you ended up uh, working as a marketing professional in the end. Oh my goodness, that's another story. <laughs> so I do have a degree in marketing, um, from college back in the day. And I worked in that for a couple of years before I went into education. I graduated with a doctorate in education about seven years ago now. And I was so excited to use my skill set to help improve in, in parts of the educational system where I thought I could. But me working for a large public school district in the US. I was not being promoted for the educational roles. They saw what I was doing with my own department to build online communities so teachers could help each other. And then how I was creating websites and leveraging email marketing to loop people in better. And I seriously was pulled um, to be a, it was a marketing consultant type role within the larger school district. And then the reason why I started my own company and working for myself was I started blogging, and this is back in 2015. I started blogging about what I knew and what I would recommend others in my shoes try out too. And people started contacting me and they were friends of friends or people who um, had worked previously with others who I was connected with on LinkedIn. So it all happened rather organically. Um, and so what I do now basically started as a side hustle that I did to help people that uh, in ways that I thought was rather easy for me, um, but they thought was really valuable. And uh, I have pivoted since then to focus more on what you introduced me as, is helping people use their backstory as a branding tool because I find the biggest challenge for basically any business, if you're a, a one person business or you're a large company, is finding your authentic voice for who your brand is and figuring out who your ideal customer avatar is and figuring out how to talk to them so that all of the marketing will be more effective. Once these essentials are, are in place and once you help your customers to discover what these essentials actually are for them. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and I have learned that I can't say what you should do. I can tell you what, I can tell you how to set up a landing page and how to do a drip email sequence. And that's not rocket science, but if you don't have your own authentic voice that really fits seamlessly with who you are, then people are not going to respond to you. And I could tell you my own journey and my own experiences of why I really believe that. But I find that if you can authentically find who you are as a person, and you and I talked about this in your interview as well, if you can find where you thrive, where you thrive the most, 
then go with that. And I help people figure that out with their own brand voice through a, a process that I have. I think this is the right moment to start talking about, about online networking and really connecting with people, right? And, and writing for other people's websites. So like, what is this? What is this all about? Why is this good? Why is this helpful? Like, what's the story of online networking and reaching out to people? I mean, you are the best example who is doing it, uh, you know, on a regular basis and how it actually helps you to grow your, uh, your website, your followers and your businesses. But like as language professionals ourselves, I'm just curious to see how we can actually use all these skills that you, you are using yourself. So one reason why I really like guest blogging is because I don't have to tell people, and, and, and I say this in quotes, I don't have to tell people how amazing I am and that they should listen to me. <laughs> I get other people to do that for me. And all I do is share what they have written. For example, I read a book that Amazon suggested to me. Um, it's called The Anti-Cell, and I forget the subtitle, but if you put into Amazon, you'll, you'll find it probably, Anti-Cell. And at the end of the book, the author, well, I read everything. That, that I read the whole book and then the afterword as well. <laughs> and the author said, look, I realize that the other marketing advisors that I referenced here, they were all men. And I think there's women out there, but all I can find is men. Are there any women marketing consultants or authors that you recommend I check out in, in, as relation to not hard selling and kind of passive, passive selling? I emailed him because I, he asked for it. <laughs> so I emailed him and I had four or five people I could recommend to him that started a relationship. It was an email relationship and it was maybe a handful of emails over a period of months. But then later he started a website for the topic of his book. I was his first guest blog post on the website. When he introduced my blog post, he said the nicest things about what I had written about and then when he shares that on LinkedIn, he shares my blog post on his website on LinkedIn, and then I reshare it on my followers. One, in one week, I had three discovery calls booked only because I reached out to somebody who was asking for help, basically. And then the relationship unfolded organically. I don't want people to think, oh, well, then how am I supposed to do that? Because <laughs> that's that's kind of a, a happenstance example. But I say that example because the results of that collaboration resulted in one week, and I forget the exact number, but it was it was unreal. I could not have gotten that doing any kind of marketing strategy of three people call me genuinely really excited about what I could offer. So that's why you should do it. Um, that's a very interesting example. And I'm just trying to imagine how we can translate it to, to kind of our world of, uh, you know, being a language professional, like who else could we partner up with and how can we use these sort of opportunities? Do you have any kind of ideas or suggestions to help us uh, think? Yeah, so I think, think of who your audience is and think of who else is talking to them. So one idea is, and in, in, I say this because some of the teachers in my Make a Leap interviews have said this, don't see your competition as competition, see them as collaborators. And I'll give you an example of what could possibly happen. I was in a podcast interview last night. Hold on, let me, let me back up. <laughs> let me back up and say, okay, 
first think of your audience then think of how you can serve that audience and i think it would be easier if you can think of a unique offer that you can offer them. And that sounds like what everyone would say, but what that looks like, for an example, for what I do is I created, for example, I created a resource library that would be useful for one specific population. In my case, it was English teachers that wanted to work in Rome. And then I thought of where would people who would be interested in that product, where would they go? Who would they be talking to? And what would they be looking for? So what I ended up doing is I Googled what someone would probably Google to find what I offered. And then I went down to um, the entire first page. And then I think I looked at like six pages of the websites that were talking about what I was offering. And I reached out to all of them. Um, so that's how I got blog posts, um, guest blog posts for my, my, Teach English in Rome project, which is now called Make a Leap. That's one thing that you can do. I think as a language professional, you can think of, for example, if you are servicing your local markets, think of who else locally serves your clients. So if you can think that maybe your clients, um, if you work with, say, small businesses, for example, and they need to learn German or Hungarian, you're the German or Hungarian teacher. And tell me if this sounds good to you. You're the German and Hungarian teacher. You know that they also talk to, for example, insurance brokers. They also need to collaborate with, for example, uh, maybe if they're a small business, they need to collab collaborate with other marketing people because they don't have a marketing team. So think of who else they will talk to on a weekly basis and figure out what kind of uh, collaboration opportunities or collaboration projects you can come up with. Another example is in my online networking, I met a small business IP attorney and she noticed what I was doing was uh, with my backstory first process, it was a process that was not common. And I was also sharing kind of how to do parts of it. She said, and, th and this is, this is kind of, this is kind of how the conversation went. She said, basically, you need to protect your intellectual property so somebody doesn't take your idea and then trademark it because you haven't. And then serve you with a cease and desist letter because they have the trademark. They don't have the audience that you have, but they have the trademark and the lawyers. So what I said to her, she's, she's helping me in that way. And I said to her, um, if I could write a blog post on her blog and then I'll link it back to my blog, that way it will serve both of our audiences. And me working and I identify as a introverted and creative um, and compassionate branding consultant, never would I think about trademarks and suing anybody and making sure I pair up with a, with a uh, IBU attorney. But I met her and we really gelled well together, our personalities. And so that collaboration really makes sense to me because we talk to the same people and I now see the overlap in what we both do. Makes, makes sense. And so this is what, uh, what guest blogging uh, really looks like, but ultimately also what we are doing here. So uh, writing a guest blog or interviewing uh, one another. So these are all examples for uh, for the same thing right yeah so 
what guest blogging originally started as is getting a link back to your website. I'm not an SEO specialist, so I don't know how much Google is prioritizing that these days. You can get a link back to your website. The more links back to your website, Google will give your website um, kind of more attention and push it up in the search engine results. There is a tool called, or there's a, a measurement called domain authority that will rank how much authority your website has with all the backlinks to it. So that's not a perfect uh, assessment, but it is an idea of why backlinks were first really important. I think Google is now deprioritizing them because they want to, they are trying to push the more authentic human connections. So the example of what I said earlier of me writing this guest blog post for this other website, him saying nice things about me, me resharing it, and then that coming back to me in a real human way, that's where I find the real value. But guest blogging was really the, uh, the emphasis early on to get those backlinks. But I think now if, if someone can get, um, say like what we're doing now, Get into a converse, get into a conversation with someone who has an audience, get onto their platform and make sure their audience is similar to what yours is. And then have an authentic communicator, authentic conversation and communicate really what you what your experiences are and how you can help people. And I think that's where the the real riches of this whole process is. Thank you. Thank you for explaining this really, really clearly. I talked about this uh, link building strategy. I, I'm not an SEO specialist myself either, but I'm interested and I'm, I'm in it and I would like to learn, learn about it. And I talked about this actually, I think in episode number nine of the first season of, um, of this podcast. So link, link building strategies, and this is exactly, th these are great examples. For, for what exactly we can actually do to increase our domain authority and make sure that our website is considered as a trustworthy website that Google happily sends, you know, prospects to. Now, what, yes, Bryn. Oh, no. So I, I can dive a little bit more into details about how to do that, but I don't know if that's what you want to do uh, in this conversation. And I don't know how much, how to how to you want to get to in this conversation? I, what I would suggest, because, because I do know that you know a lot actually about this. I know you don't consider yourself to be an expert, but I think you are someone who can really explain these things in a very practical way and bring it home. So I'm thinking about, about setting up maybe another conversation where we can dive deeper into, uh, into this with you, if that's okay, to keep these nuggets yeah. bite-sized. <laughs> yeah, definitely, okay. <laughs> Really, really cool. I, I will stop talking about link building right now then. <laughs> but thank you honestly for bringing it up because it's really, really interesting. And I think that this is something that we keep forgetting about. Sometimes we create our website and we feel that, okay, now it's there, but it's a, it's a closed universe, you know, unless we really reach out to people and connect to people through the websites as well. And this is what link building and, and guest blogging and guest interviewing is basically all about. So interlinking and uh, and this way, uh, including yeah. our authority, so to say, in the online space. What I yeah. want to steer our conversation to is um, is about, well, both of us, I would say, because I know we had a conversation about this, both of us are actually on the introvert side, right? Uh, and yet, here you are, you know, reaching out to people, making online connections, initiating conversations. So how do you overcome these feelings of, of insecurities that we can have as, um, as introverts? Like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with this? Honestly, so I am an introvert and I know that for sure, for certain, is because if I get up in front of 100 people <laughs> and I give a talk to 100 people, it will completely drain me. And I will, I will be exhausted afterwards. I will feel like I'm kind of um, 
like my nerve, well, I'm also a highly sensitive person. And I'm saying this because in my experience interviewing now over 20 uh, independent language teachers, I have a feeling there are more highly sensitive people in, in, in the audience um, from the conversations I've been having. So my nervous system is, is pretty finely tuned. So those are both benefits and hurdles that I kind of have to get over sometimes. What I realized though, is that me genuinely like liking to talk to other people and hearing their stories and then connecting with them in an authentic way. I know that, for example, if, if I'm traveling and I sit next to someone on the airplane, I don't always do this, but I can easily get a fast friend on an airplane. <laughs> um, if, we're, if, if, if we are chatting just one-on-one. -on -one. And so I think not so much of my own anxieties possibly, but I think of the value that someone might feel if I reach out to them. And I don't think of, oh, me, Brim Benino, this is what I can gain. What I do first, and this is so I can lead with serving my population and being as helpful and, and as genuine as possible, is I think of one kind of finite product that I cannot be the expert maybe, but be a learning leader in. For example, I had, I had independent language teachers that were coming to me and asking me for advice. I have never successfully been a independent language teacher that had my own business and my full book of clients. I did it some, but it's, um, it's not something that I have uh, successfully done myself. So I thought, why don't I get the stories of the people that are doing the thing? And then that way I can offer that unique project as an offer to talk about, for example, or if you don't want to um, interview 20 experts in a field, um, <laughs> I understand why you wouldn't because it's a big time commitment, but think of one thing you're really good at and offer that as your offer to talk about that thing. So that way the focus is not on you if you don't want it to be on you, if you have anxieties about reaching out to people. So think of the focus of helping an audience with your unique product that you can't find anyone else who has done that thing. And maybe someone else would like to talk to you about it too. I, I love this. And uh, the way I try to reframe my mind whenever I just had enough of myself, you know, just seeing myself all the time in the, in the video or in a, hearing my voice even in a, in a podcast or whenever I feel that, or, or simply just, you know, reaching out to people again and again. Whenever I feel that, oh my God, it's getting too much, I always say to myself, this is not about you. It's not about you. It's about the community that you serve. And it's my responsibility to do it, you know, because otherwise I'm kind of, I'm stealing from people who write you, you know, it's quite radical to say it, but, but you know, I, I need to show up for people who might actually need what, uh, what I have. And, and so this is not about me. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I think that going back to being an introvert, there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. And so do, do things your way and do things the way that you're comfortable in. And it might be quieter than, say, the leaders that you see in this space. But maybe you think they're a leader because they're a louder voice. But there are so many examples of quieter leaders that are producing really good products and they are leading people to do what they're doing because they're doing it in their own way that they feel comfortable with. Totally, totally. Um, okay, so I've got two final questions, both of them on marketing. And so the first one would be, what would you say is the most critical skill in marketing that has made a difference in your marketing business? 
Okay. And, and this is going not so much to um, maybe a digital marketing strategy, but I am comfortable getting on a soapbox and saying, know yourself. <laughs> this has been said for thousands of thousands of years, know thyself first and use that as your lighthouse and it will all fall into place. I could talk about building a website and email marketing, and those are good too. <laughs> but first, use your backstory as a tool. Um, and, and then everything else, if you understand who you are and not so much all the details and nitty gritties of your life experiences, but analyze your own backstory to find your philosophical world values and your life lessons from your tough experiences, that's how you operate in the world. That's where you feel the most comfortable and that's how people will see you. So if you use that as your lighthouse, then everything else will fall into place. And the right kind of people will, will resonate to that. Exactly. I think that you and I can probably both talk about attracting the wrong kind of clients and then wondering how in the world that happens, because that's the last thing you wanted. But there was something that was off in your messaging that was not aligned with who you are. And that's why you attracted the wrong kind of client. Makes, makes so, and, and, and not to say for me to not attract um, those kinds of clients I don't want to work with, I don't explicitly say in my terms of conditions, I won't work with this person, this person, or this person. But what I'm doing is I'm using my backstory as a tool with the framework of um, digging out the uh, most salient emotions I feel and the values and the life lessons. And people who identify with that, they come and they're happy to. And then the people I don't like, they don't talk to me and that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> really really powerful thank you and finally if you could give us language professionals just one one piece of marketing advice what would it be okay so I think that language professionals they okay let me think about this <laughs> one piece of advice what I'm going to say is taken from the 20 interviews that I have so far published and I analyze them for what everyone is saying, what the recurring patterns are. Me, Brim Benino, running my own business, I would have said to you, <laughs> you need an email list. But the 20 language teachers that I have interviewed, all of them so far, 14 of them have been from Italy and then um, all of them have been based in Europe somewhere. Um, well, I'll just say that. <laughs> so mostly Italy and then the rest Europe somewhere. Um, they all said, hands down, shift your mindsets. If you're an independent language teacher, you are an entrepreneur. And I think that is more powerful than Brim Benino saying, build your email list. <laughs> Because if you think of what your experience is and what skills you um, were able to really grow from when you were working in a school, those skills are maybe seem at odds with running a business. But if you can, and I'll say meditate and do visualization practices and uh, do breathe, deep breathing exercises and really own up to the fact that you are an entrepreneur. You're a business person now. And if you see yourself as that, then I think things will go more easily for you. And I don't just think that I found 12 interviews where people said that to me um, in various in various fashions. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, honestly. Bryn, thank you. Thank you so much for this, Gabriella. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much for all these valuable insights and all the wisdom that you shared, shared with us. And we will make sure to include Bryn's links in the podcast notes. 
do check them out and make sure you follow her work. And I really hope that this conversation was useful and applicable to you and your language business. Again, my name is Gabriela Ferenti, and if you want to get more bite-sized, easy to digest episodes on practical, modern online marketing, then make sure to subscribe to this podcast. And for more resources, you might want to visit gabrielaferenci.com forward slash thrive online, which is where I share even more. All these links are available in the podcast notes. And so with that, thank you. Thank you again for Brain. Thank you very much for listening and tuning in for our listeners. And those of you who are following our uh, channel on YouTube, thank you very much for, for watching and we will see you next time. Take care and goodbye now.